Hey listeners, we're nearing the end of our 15th anniversary fundraising campaign and we need your help to meet our goal. This campaign offers you a chance to win a unique food and music experience in one of the most exciting cities in America. Here's how it works. Donate to HRN and you'll be entered to win dinner for two and two tickets to a concert in one of eight amazing cities. New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Nashville, Las Vegas, Charleston, Ardmore, Pennsylvania, and Asheville. All donations support our work educating food system storytellers. And when you donate, you can choose one of those cities and you'll be entered to win dinner and two tickets to a show. So help us reach our goal and enter to win dinner and a show in the city of your choice. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15. Thank you. Today's program is brought to you by Tabard Inn, new American cuisine in one of Washington, D.C.'s oldest hotels, located in DuPont Circle. For more information, visit tabardin.com. I'm Greg Blaze, host of Cutting the Curd. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network, broadcasting live from Bushwick, Brooklyn. If you like this program, visit heritageradionetwork.org for thousands more. All right. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Heritage Radio Network. We are coming to you, as always, uh, live from the back of Roberta's Pizza here in Bushwick, Brooklyn. And you're listening to The Farm Report. I'm your host, Erin Fairbanks. Every week on The Farm Report, we take a look at the food system from uh, producer to consumer, kind of chatting along the line, uh, all the things that we need to know. Off air, I am the executive director of the Heritage Radio Network, and one of the one of the issues that we've been covering a lot on the radio since we started in 2009 is the um, sockeye salmon run up in Bristol Bay, Alaska. And I'm really excited uh, today. We are joined on the line by Chef William Disson. Chef, welcome to the show. Oh, Chef, do we have you? Hey, how's it going? <laughs> it's going great. It's going great. Um, so uh, Chef Disson is calling in from down in Asheville, North Carolina, uh, where he runs the Marketplace Restaurant. Um, he is also recently back from Alaska. He took a trip out there via um, Chef's Collaborative and is going to give us a little bit of an update on what he saw up in Alaska and how we should be kind of thinking about salmon and the salmon industry here in the U.S. So... Chef, one of the things that was so interesting to me is is kind of this idea of what the sockeye salmon run looks like. I mean, 40 million salmon in six weeks. Can you give us a sense of what that space was like when you kind of landed on the ground? And, and you, are the salmon just kind of like jumping out of the river into nets? Or, or what's the scene? Well, we got there actually right before the salmon started running. So things were pretty quiet, and we had a lot of we met a lot of fishermen and women that were were really chomping at the bit, ready to get out in the water. Uh, so it was really actually cool to be there early and get to speak with people about how the industry works, uh, see some of the facilities, meet some of the fishermen and women, uh, meet some of the local um, subsistence fishermen and women as well. Um, but it was great to really see that when the salmon started to run, you could see this really amazing connection with the ecosystem, just with the different animals, the birds of prey, and bears, you know. They could sense when the salmon were coming, and you could see a, a bigger presence around the water. And once they hit, it's just it's awesome to see. You know, you, you could you know figuratively walk on water. The, the rivers are so just full of salmon. Yeah, I kind of like imagine it's like that classic National Ge- Geographic image of like the bear in the water, like snacking on salmon, like out of a almost kind of a storybook. I mean, was that like the the scene? That was. We actually uh, went out to Brooks Falls in the Katmai National Park, which is where most of the National Geographic covers that you see with the bear grabbing the salmon out of the waterfall, where the, most of those are photographed. Uh, we definitely saw quite a bit of that. There were tons of huge bears and uh, and lots and lots of salmon up there. That's wild. So, well, let's back up a little bit and hear a little bit more about your background um, so the marketplace uh, down in Asheville, North Carolina. What kind of restaurant is that? 
Yeah, so the marketplace uh, has been around for 36 years. Uh, I've been the chef and owner here for the past six. Uh, you know, really, we are an ingredient-driven, uh, seasonal, locally sourcing, new American-style restaurant. And, and so we, re- we really focus on relationships with our, our farmers and artisan producers so we're able to get the best and most sustainable products possible. And you guys are, you know, so you're about 120 seats, 32 at the bar, and like a, then you also have like a little bit of an outdoor space? We have about 20 seats outside in our patio, so it's a good-sized restaurant. So North Carolina to Alaska, um, how did you end up with uh, sockeye salmon on your menu? Well, um, I'm on the uh, Blue Ribbon Task Force with the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch Program, and... I was uh, honored as a Seafood Watch ambassador a few years back, and, and my restaurant's been a partner with the aquarium and the Seafood Watch for a number of years now as well. <laughs> and so um, we've made a pledge to only serve and sell and to advocate for sustainable seafood. You know, and people say, well, you know, you're in the mountains in Asheville. Why, why do you even care? Um, you know, there's a lot of, quote, unquote, a lot of fish in the sea, right? And, you know, there, just as we source local you know, there's a really major connection with, you know, with how we source our, our seafood because, there, you know, frankly, aren't a lot of fish in the sea. And in my career as a chef, I've, you know, I've seen, uh, for instance, grouper off the North Carolina, South Carolina coast that 10 years ago used to be 30-pound fish uh, on average. Now we're coming in as like a five, six-pound fish. And, you know, you really have a connection with that when you're, when you're ordering it and filleting it on a daily basis and realizing that, you know, hey, something's happening here. Um, and so that's when I really started to ask questions and how I got involved with the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Um, and so one thing led to another, and you know, we really started focusing more on that sustainable side of seafood. And fortuitously, one day I had a local uh, fisherwoman, her name is Heidi Dunlap, and owns a company called the Wild Salmon Company. Um, lives in Asheville eight months a year and then lives in Bristol Bay, Alaska for four months. Fishes out of the Dillingham area. She came in with uh, some sockeye salmon. She said, you know, hey, we love your commitment to local and sustainable uh we'd love you know, love to have our fish in here and i kind of quickly turned my nose up to her and said oh i don't buy frozen fish um and she said well defrost it cook it eat it let me know what you think and um maybe we can do business and like i said i kind of turned my nose up to her and went back to my my task in the kitchen but did go ahead and you know defrost and cook the fish I think I called her an hour, hour and a half later and ordered 500 pounds. <laughs> wow. Well, that, okay. So that is, that is a turnaround and, you know, kind of this, I, I do want to talk a little bit about this idea of fish being fresh or frozen. I mean, I, it's something, you know, here in New York city, the health department just passed um, a law that if you want to serve sushi fish or fish for ceviche and, and other raw preparations, it has to have been frozen at some point along its life cycle. And my initial reaction to that was like, oh, wow, Um, you know, this is like the end of fresh fish. And it means that like things aren't going to be good. And and the more sushi chefs I ended up chatting with, the more people were like, oh, yeah, that's already happening. Actually, most fish is frozen. And I'm wondering, is that something that you have found to be the case or that like the sockeye story kind of illuminated for you? Well, you know, I I know it definitely happens. I know that there is a definitely a health factor with it that there are innate parasites and bacteria in certain types of fish and by freezing them your uh the freezing process actually kills those off um it makes the fish you know safer to eat overall doesn't mean that the fish is unsafe to eat if it's you know completely fresh out of the water no it doesn't but it means that um You know, children and and elderly people who may be more susceptible to, you know, some type of illness um, are going to be less susceptible because you're going to be killing those uh, killing those items off by the freezing process. By the freezing process. Um, Well, so let's maybe talk a little bit about uh, what makes a sockeye salmon uh, a sockeye salmon um, and and how they're different from other other (laughs) types of salmon. Sure. Um, You know, while I was up in I was up in Alaska. The two salmon species that were running were the uh, the king salmon and then the sockeye. And the king salmon are, you know, they're these beautiful, big, lazy salmon that just kind of float along the bottom of the river working their way upstream, where the sockeye are are just are just fervent and and aggressively swimming upstream um, and working out really hard to get up there. Um, and so the sockeye are definitely larger, you know, or excuse me, the the king, you have a larger fat content on it, 
um, and they're more definitely more of a delicacy. But the sockeye, I feel like because they're such high-energy fish, um, that's why they've got that really bright red flesh. And I feel like that's what makes their taste um, a lot more unique than other types of salmon. Just really, really beautiful, really, really wonderful, sweet flavor. So, yeah, they they end up uh, sockeye, also sometimes called like red or blueback salmon, um, native to like the North Pacific Ocean. And I think what else is interesting is like the, the life cycle of a sockeye salmon because they essentially, the the salmon run, I mean, give us a sense of what are they running for? What's their like job? Sure. So they, you know, they have, at least from, from my knowledge, about a three to four year life cycle. And they start out in fresh water, the headwaters of a river upstream where they start out as egg, make their way they grow uh, down river, uh, get large enough to get out to the ocean, and then they go live out in the ocean for one to two years. And at that point, they spawn, and they, you know, they have this this thing goes off and says, "Hey, it's time to go home and go back inland." And so then they work their way back upstream so they can lay their eggs and then die and start the life cycle all over again. Yeah, it's like so wild. So they go from fresh water to salt water. Um, it's kind of like this birth death journey, you know, through all these like different rivers and headways out to the ocean and then back, which I think also from a kind of land and river conservation standpoint really kind of illustrates why it's important to protect the diversity of waterways. Uh, I don't know if you had a chance to catch the film, um, the breach, um, So one of the things I thought, you know, so that was a film really, I highly recommend it. If you're out there, if you're interested in salmon, you can find it via um, iTunes for a couple of bucks. They're also doing screenings around the country. Um, Wonderful, really deep dive into the life cycle uh, of sockeye salmon. And I thought the visuals in the film were so interesting, especially when you're thinking about how animals like move around and they had all these instances where you know we put up as as men you know man-made objects dams and different um impediments to the natural life cycle like direction of the salmon and it's kind of wild you said it's like there's a thing that goes off in their head and i think that's like a little hard for us as humans to understand but like all of a sudden you just know that you're supposed to go back to this place and how disorienting it must be if you like kind of go and you can't get there well and it's like in in the film the breach and even just from just being in alaska and seeing how this whole lifestyle cycle works you can really feel just this this deep connection with nature and like they were saying in the, in the movie that you know the salmon are in everything that when they when they come back upstream and they die and they decompose you know, all those nutrients and minerals go back into the water, which go back into the into the watershed and the ground outside of the river systems and into the roots of the trees and grasses and, and grow up to create nature. And there's, you know, really a, a deep connection to the land. Yeah, it's really beautiful. Um, so you, you ended up out in Alaska via the Chef's Collaborative. So how did you get involved with that organization, and, and what prompted you to kind of, like, uh, make the trip? Yeah, well, I've been a, a member of Chef's Collaborative for quite a while. Um, they, you know, their core mission parallels, parallels my own in, in restaurants where, you know, we, we want to make sure that we're making the most sustainable choices possible and not necessarily from a, you know, hyper- "Quote unquote green perspective," but just because, in my opinion, you know, if you're making sustainable choices, you're creating a relationship with your with your purveyor, with your farmer, with your fisherman, and you're getting the best possible product. So at the end of the day, you're going to have really fresh, flavorful food on the plate for your guests. Um, and so with that, you know, I, you know, frankly, I was uh, was online uh, at the Chef's Grill Laboratory site and saw that they had a an opportunity to go to Alaska and reached out to them about it and told them my story of, you know, my connection with, uh, with Bristol Bay salmon. And yeah, one thing led to another and, um, the summer had the, the opportunity of a lifetime to get up there. Yeah. Yeah. So anything that you were, um, really surprised by that you're like, Oh, I thought it was going to be really like this. And it was really not, or really was, or more than you could have imagined. It was more than I could have ever imagined. Alaska is, is an amazing place. You know, the, 
the license plates on all the cars there say, you know, Alaska and their state motto is the last frontier. Um, and it truly is. You know, we in Bristol Bay, even with all that was going on, I mean, you feel like you're at the edge of the world there. Just, you know, using adjectives raw and epic and, and natural is an understatement. Yeah, and, and yet um, they run one of, like a world-renowned fishery, um, one of the most sustainable um, fisheries uh, in the world. Also, so interesting that, you know, when you're looking at where that salmon is going, uh, we end up sending a lot of the sockeye to uh, Japan and to countries outside of the U.S., which I, th- I always think is so weird because salmon's like literally the most popular fish that we eat in this country, but we end up importing a lot or buying a lot of farm salmon and then sending kind of the best salmon in our country away. Why do you think that happens? You know, I, anything happens, I guess, at the end of the day when it comes down to dollars and cents, right? Um, you know, the, the sushi market in Japan and abroad is just so strong. And, you know, it's like trading, it's like commodities trading when it comes down to the sockeye. So, I mean, how does that work in your restaurant when it comes down to price? Because obviously, you know, you're working within the same, um, you know, constraints of other restaurants in your area. There's the, the population that you're serving and what folks are willing to pay and 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 how do you make those kind of buying decisions and and is the the sakai kind of an expensive item for you it is but you know we have buying power in that you know i just like i mentioned i have relationships with my lo- local farmers i also have a wonderful relationship with uh with Ms. heidi from the wild salmon company um and we buy in bulk so we have that buying power in that we're making a commitment to buy you know a thousand plus pounds a year so it, because you have so that must mean you have like space to put that or they're delivering it in like smaller increments or so they'll deliver it weekly and you know we'll buy buy the filet in, in increments throughout the week and fortunately for us Heidi's got a uh, a walk-in freezer at her home in a nearby neighborhood and she's able to deliver to us weekly oh well then I mean it's like a kind of a non-traditional relationship but something that you guys have worked out to have this really special fish uh, on your menu it is, yeah. You know, I think in, in creating relationships like this, you know, certainly be a lot easier to work with with a larger cooperative or a larger purveyor. But creating a, the relationship with the fisherwoman, you know, I know who's catching my fish. I know how she's catching it. I know where it's coming from. And that's part of the story that I can pass on to my servers to um, relate to my guests. And I think that's that's part of the that's part of the the charm of, of eating it. You know, you know how you're you know where the fish is coming from. So how are you serving it? Oh, let's see. Um, this past year we had a uh, zatar spiced um, wild sockeye, and that came with uh, a coriander crema and a, uh, and a harissa and came with a, a quinoa pilaf. Wow. I have a note here on my, on my sheet that just says like pesto, but I can't remember what is like pesto. I feel like we were when we were we were chatting last week. We were kind of talking about about the maybe what's the fat content of the fish that it freezes really well and like why it, it works more for salmon. But I, I was wondering if that prompted anything for you. Not off the top of my head, but you know, certainly. <laughs> maybe certainly I was just it. hungry for lunch. <laughs> it sounds like it. <laughs> it was like my own yeah. brainstorm. <laughs> but yeah, you know, pesto or something herbaceous it goes really well with the, the fat content. Uh, in the sockeye salmon for sure in the sockeye salmon cool well chef we are going to take just a short break and when we come back we're going to be joined on the line by christopher nicholson a longtime sockeye salmon fisherman so hang tight you're listening to the farm report and we'll be right back
Hi, I'm Harold McGee. HeritageRadioNetwork.org is a nonprofit organization, which means they depend on the support of listeners like you and like me. The best way you can support this program and others like it is to visit HeritageRadioNetwork.org, as I have, and click the Donate button to become a member today, as I have. Thanks for listening, and thanks for your support. The following program has been brought to you by Tabard Inn. Tabard Inn, Washington, D.C.'s quintessential small hotel, is located on a quiet, tree-lined street just five blocks from the White House. Vibrant yet unassuming, the Tabard is comprised of 40 sleeping rooms, each unique in character and design. Feast on eclectic American cuisine in their acclaimed restaurant, or enjoy a cocktail and listen to live jazz in one of their cozy Victorian seating areas. Mingle with travelers from around the world who find the Tabard the only place to stay when taking their travels to Washington. For more information, visit TabardIn.com. Paul, what's up, world? It's Mandy Fresh, and you're listening to Heritage Radio Network. Welcome back. You're listening to The Farm Report. We are on the line with Chef William Disson from the Marketplace Restaurant down in Asheville, North Carolina. And in the second half of the show, we are joined by fisherman uh, extraordinaire Christopher Nicholson of the Iliama Fish Co. Chris, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me on. Hello, William. Hello, Aaron. Hey, guys. Uh, so... It- Chris, we just uh, we've been chatting with William about his recent trip up to the Bristol Bay area. He won a scholarship through Chefs Collaborative and, and did a whole tour uh, of the fishery. We were learning some of his observations, but thought it would be great to bring you in to give us the fisherman's perspective on this year's sockeye salmon run. So, how how was the run? How's it going? Um, what are the needs to know for the 2015 season? Uh, great question. Uh- I'll say two things real quick, just because I'm hopping on right now. Thanks so much for coming up and visiting uh, uh, Chef Nissen. I, I know that you've been a supporter of uh, Alaska and the Bristol Bay in particular for some years. So just I'm so glad you come and poke around and check us out up there and spend some time up there. And Aaron, thank you for having me on. Uh, I'll give a quick snapshot of my perspective of the 2015 uh, season in Bristol Bay. There are five districts in Bristol Bay, and I fish in the area that's called the Quijack area. It's one of the, um, it's kind of the uh, innermost of the five uh, fishing districts there. And I guess not dissimilar from the other five regions for all of Bristol Bay, for all five regions, including mine, it was, it was a very late run. Like we, um, normally we expect um, the fish to kind of uh, crest for the peak of the run to be somewhere between the 4th and the 7th of July. And this year, around that time, it was actually really quiet. It was a real um, um, quiet uh, numbers of fish coming in. Um, there weren't no fish, but it wasn't especially um, um, high numbers. And then late, at least for what we would consider to be late, like starting around the 12th, 13th, uh, 14th, we started to catch a lot of fish. And from our perspective, it looks like the peak of the run may have been even as late as the 15th or 16th. Like, they were just... Uh, unbelievable quantities of fish, something um, that we haven't seen like that for um, in my uh, fishing life ever. Um, so anyway, it was, it was a very interesting year. It was very uncommon from years past. So do you have any sense or is there kind of any conversation around why the increase in volume and why the delay in the season? Well, I, other than um, fishermen's conjecture, um, I, I don't have some real wisdom to bring to it, um, not from a kind of a oceanographic or biological perspective, but from a, just a conjectural perspective, I wonder if it has something to do with the warmth of the um, of the early part of the summer. And, I mean, how fish and sockeye salmon in particular respond to water temperatures is, is a subject of endless... Um, kind of debate and conjecture amongst biologists and fishermen, but it was incredibly warm uh, for June and even through early July in Bristol Bay. And when I say incredibly warm, like the ambient air temperatures, we had um, sustained days of high 70s, which is pretty uncommon for Bristol Bay, and we were hitting 80s uh, some of the days there. After the first week of July, the temperature started to um, get back down to what we would normally consider Bristol Bay temperatures, like 50s, 60s, kind of rainy and cool. And it seems at least somewhat possible that, that just cooler air temperatures 
um, help change maybe some water currents, maybe some pressures, stuff like that, that would cause the fish to kind of wait out in deeper water till it um, felt cool enough or kind of right for them to move upstream. But it, that is truly conjecture. Um, so can you talk a little bit about... Um, you know, I think it's so interesting, this idea of the season's bounty kind of expanding and contracting from year to year. And if you are and the ability as as someone who's like making, um, you know, a business and making a living out of that salmon run, how do you deal with the with a really big season or a really small season um, from both like a cash flow standpoint, but also just like equipment and infrastructure like did did you run into challenges because there was so much fish this year or is that just like a good problem that is a great question um i could say i can answer it a a few ways i'll try and keep it kind of succinct it's definitely a challenge like it um it is um it does cost uh cause me and my you know fellow family fishing members, a lot of agita, just, oh my goodness, there's not going to be any fish this year. And then, whoa, suddenly there's a whole bunch of fish. Just, um, it, it surely is stressful, kind of um, um, waiting for fish when there aren't fish. Um, but when fish do hit, it is always a lot of joy for us. We're always so grateful um, when, we do, when they do uh, come in. Um, so that's just kind of a, a personal, or how it affects me personally. Kind of from an equipment uh, standpoint, um, we do uh, it does affect how we use our equipment, how hard it gets uh, used, um, um, based on how heavy the fish kind of come in. The best way to fish, both for quality and for you know, kind of wear and tear on our bodies and on the uh, little nets we make and on our boats and stuff like that is when there's steady, even fish. Um, real big slugs of super heavy fish are really hard on your body and hard in the gear and hard in your boat. So we like it when it's not um, just kind of crazy density. I, I guess I'll say just to say a little more about 2015, I'm grateful that this year there were there was a good volume of fish that came in there and we ended up having a good number that came through. The way that we were fishing this year and just the way they happened to hit in the Quijack district, we never had any of those kind of terrifying walls of fish, which do, that definitely happens for us sometimes. But this year, even though it was a good catch and good numbers, it wasn't that kind of biblical fear um, <laughs> when the fish did hit. Because sometimes they, the way that the school moves in, it, it really is just kind of horrifying. That the water is empty and suddenly the water is just full and your nets are completely sunk. And it's just, you know two human bodies or sometimes three on a boat to pull in thousands and thousands of pounds by hand, you know, so that is, I'm glad it was one of those terrifying sort of biblical walls. I'm grateful for that. I, I would say, Chef, that definitely kind of um, reminds me of the scene you said at the top of the show and also kind of the way I think about working in a in a restaurant kitchen, like hopefully the orders come in in a smooth, steady, manageable way versus the like seating of the dining room all at once in a huge onslaught. Um, but what, yeah. that, what that brings up for me um, is, is thinking, um, Chef Dissin, around this idea of kind of feast or famine and, and you as a chef, when things are super high in season and there's like a, a big volume of them um, or, you know, there's kind of like this opportunity and the scarcity that happens, especially when you're focused on local procurement. And, and how do you kind of deal with that? Like what advantages or issues does it bring up from a restaurant perspective? Well, we, we print our menus in-house. So if we need to change the menu, we can do it whenever we want. That helps a lot. So then you, um, you can just adjust, yeah. Yeah, and we, we change our menu a pretty fair amount anyway. And that's something that, you know, I try to get a pre-order with uh, my fisherwoman, Heidi, but, you know, sometimes, like you said, the, the season is prolific and there's 50 million fish, but then other years there's not. And so, you know, she needs to make her money too, so she may be selling elsewhere rather rather than wholesale to a restaurant. Um, and I think, you know, something that, that we were talking about when I was in the Naknak area is that that's kind of the beauty of, of the sockeye run is that there's so many things in the world still that are predictable and that we can, you know, we can put our money on it. But the sockeye yeah. season, it's one of the, it's one of those things, you do, you know, you, you know, it's going to happen, but when it actually starts, you can't predict it. Um, they, yep. you know, yep. they do that themselves. Mm-hmm. 
So, Chris, Maybe. how do you plan? I mean, do you, ju- you just, like, make your best guess and, and then deal with what comes? Yes, I think that's, that's really it. Um, the, the way that we, uh, that we are allowed to fish, which is wonderful, that's one of the reasons why the fishery is so healthy, why it's so sustainable, the um, Alaska Department of Fish and Game Biologists who manage the fishery, they give us little windows of fishing time, and they're choosing those windows based on um, the number of fish that they're seeing moving to the district, the number of fish that have safely escaped upstream to spawn, um, you know, so there's there's a calculus or kind of a science to it. So I was just giving that as context. But when you actually, you know, set put your nets in the water, it it is a, a wonderful um, kind of reminder of one's uh, mortality and lack of knowledge about the mystical uh, kind of mystical aspects of the physical world. Like, I don't know. Are we going to catch fish? I hope so. Like, oh my goodness, when it just it it's kind of wonderful to be uh, subject to both the sea and the uh, wonderful wild whims of fish. Yeah, and I think, too, that illustrates the kind of, uh, you know, the tension between dealing with something that is seasonal, that is special. I I know um, a chef that I worked for, Peter Hoffman at Savoy, I, I asked him as a young cook, I'm like, well, chef, you know, you really care about, like, local, so why are we serving the sockeye salmon? And he, you know, he... He said that essentially there's there's some things in the world that are of a place and, and so special and so distinct and also in need of protection. And one of the ways that you support those types of things is by, you know, buying them and eating them a few times a year and really recognizing that kind of special factor. Um, but the Bristol, Bristol Bay Sockets Salmon have needed kind of other types of protection and involvement than just the really happy problem of us getting to eat great fish. And Chris, I wonder if you can talk yes. a little bit about, um, aside from just changes in the season, the other main threat to these salmon, which of course is the pebble mine. Yeah, that is a, an issue of ongoing concern. Um, it, I, I think, um, like many fishermen, I'm really excited that currently, under the current administration, Bristol Bay has been chosen to be protected by the EPA um, under the Clean Water Act. But um, as we know, as Americans, administrations change, and uh, the you know, litigation can really change how things like that will eventually play out. Right now, um, Bristol Bay is um, protected from further development of the Pebble Project by the um, EPA's um, kind of levying of the Clean Water Act over it. But it, it surely is an ongoing uh, concern. And I can give just a 30-second snapshot for listeners of this uh, Pebble project we're talking about. Please do. So, yeah, Bristol Bay, which is home to the world's largest uh, wild, sustainable sockeye salmon run, um, also happens to have at its watershed base um, what is understood to be the largest deposit of coal, uh, gold, uh, copper, and molybdenum. And the way that it would be necessary to extract those um valuable uh, resources would be by hard rock uh, mining, which is a kind of a cyanide bleaching style of uh, mining. And it just uh, seems to us as fishermen that there couldn't be a worse place to kind of park um, a hard uh, rock mining uh, um, organization than at the watershed base of the pristine largest wild sustainable sockeye salmon fishery in the world. (laughs) <laughs> you can imagine why that's kind of a yes, not such a great not fashion, a big jump yeah. there. Yeah, exactly. Well, um, one of the things I want to touch on with you, Chef, is um, you know the New York Times has been doing a lot of really amazing coverage of the the fishing industry, and and just this week they published uh, a really disturbing expose on the source of fish that is most commonly found here in the U.S. in in the dog and the cat food that our animals consume. And they outline, um, you know, these trollers that essentially act as 
um, slave ships, um, taking kind of Cambodian migrants out to sea, um, making them work in really horrible conditions. And one of the challenges that the article does a great job in illuminating is this idea of sourcing and traceability in where fish is coming from. So I'm wondering for you as a restaurant chef, obviously the line to sockeye salmon is very clear. You're, you know, you're dealing with a specific person. You've made the trip yourself. But when you're looking at sourcing seafood from other spaces, um, how do you how do you know what you're getting is coming from a source that's in line with your values? What are the what are the clues? What are the things you look for as a chef? Well, it actually took me a few years. I I was working with um, a regional seafood purveyor, and you know we'd order, for instance, we'd order red snapper from the Gulf, and would come in um, from the from the Southeast Atlantic where where it's being overfished. Um, and so I'd return it and say, well, that's not the right fish. And they'd say, oh, well, it's fine. Um, you know, or, or I'd order snapper and they'd send me red grouper as a substitute. I'd say, well, that's not, that's not what we ordered. We want, you know, more traceability and more transparency in what I'm, what I'm ordering. So I, stopped, I told them, I said, I'm going to stop ordering from you guys. This is it's unacceptable. You know, I, it's causing me double work and it's causing a headache for, for how I write my menus. Um, and it just doesn't follow our, our our philosophies and practices at the restaurant. And I told them I wanted them to start having the uh, Seafood Watch ratings on their order guides. And they said, oh, you know, not going to happen. And so finally they kept harassing me. I came back to them and I you know, went back and, and showed them how much I had spent with them over the previous year on seafood alone. And lo and behold, the next couple of weeks, they started putting sustainability ratings on their order guides. And they started listing, you know, who the fishermen were that, um, uh, that were catching the fish and where it was coming from. And so then I was able to kind of finish that circle and, and get back into um, into order from them and having a better idea of where my fish comes from. Great work. Hooray. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> and, you know, at, at the end of the day, it comes down to money. And, you know, you can tell people your philosophical ideals and beliefs, but when you put dollar signs in front of people, that's usually when things start to happen. Um, well, uh-huh. Chris, kind of turning that issue over in in your direction, what are things that help you as a fisherman make sure that you know the story of your fish is is being told and that you're not getting lumped in um, things that really aren't salmon or really aren't sake or or are different things? Like, what are the tools that you have at your disposal? That that's a really good question. Um, I don't know if this is a, as broad an answer as it could be or as might be helpful, but I think maybe for my family and I, just we, the way that we are currently selling our catch, um, we aren't able to sell our whole catch um, through our little family business. We sell as much of it as we can. Um, the stuff that we can't sell through our family business, we sell wholesale the processors on the fishing grounds. So for that, um, the, I'm just describing a little bit about how we work in terms of the fishing business. Um, so the stuff that we sell wholesale, that is up to the Alaska processors to kind of, you know, manage the story of how that fish is sold and marketed. And, you know, um, sometimes your relationship as a fisherman with, a, you know, a, a big cannery can be as negative as John Steinbeck's Cannery Row kind of characters, or it can be as positive as, you know, just the kind of closest collaboration you can imagine. Separate from that, the way that my family and I sell our catches personally, I guess the work that we do is um, as kind of direct maybe as a server at a table. You know, we just we we cultivate uh, customers that we know and who want to have a relationship with with the fisherman or with the person who's catching the fish. And I think um, as much as we're able to kind of develop those sort of personal relationships with people who are interested in that kind of stuff, we can help, um, you know, kind of uh, sustain our family and sustain the business in that way. So I thought that was kind of a roundabout way to d- try to describe that the personal relationships, I guess, are the most important aspect for us as fishermen in terms of kind of uh, um, making our family business sustainable. Does that make any sense? No, that totally makes sense. Yeah, that's great. And, and folks can still buy salmon from you now? 
Um, now, the way that we've been selling our, our catch over the past couple of years, we are um, selling it before our season. So we sell to both restaurants and to wonderful distributors like Heritage Foods USA. Um, <laughs> um, um, be- Full disclosure. <laughs> and, and <laughs> a little shameless plug there. Um, and then also... Uh, to uh, to a kind of a, a small uh, community supported fishery, we host um, a location here where I live in Brooklyn, New York. We host a location in Portland, Oregon, where my cousin Reed, who kind of founded um, our family's um, uh, CSF model, lives, and then another cousin who lives in uh, Anchorage, Alaska. So in those three locations, we kind of host uh, CSFs. But I told you a whole bunch. You asked if I had fish for sale right now. We pre-sold our catch, so we don't have an inventory on hand that we sell right now. But if you're interested, you can go to heritagefoodsusa.com and pick up an order now. No, oh, yeah, I didn't know that they had some I, left. Yeah. I'm going to get an. I got one. Um, I got one a couple weeks ago that was delicious. So I will have to uh, purchase I, another. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm so glad I, we, we send down a little bit fresh and uh, uh, during the season. So, oh, I'm so glad you had. Some yeah, no, I, I definitely that was like at the top of my list. I'm like, I'm like, it's July, it's sockeye salmon. I'm ready. Um, I always have like a big get together uh, where we get to break down the salmon with everybody oh, and kind of talk about the. So but, cool. It's definitely, you know, I have to say, um, for me, it, it makes me feel a little bit like um, reminiscent of my my chefing days, but also. Thinks, thinking a lot about some of the work that Chefs Collaborative does around hosting hosting kind of dinners where you can kind of Wonderful. do this type of storytelling. So um, was just you know it, it always exciting to to have the salmon in house um, and and to get a taste of it fresh. Uh, I felt super lucky this year. Oh, oh so such, cool! Such a special yeah, fish. Yeah, totally. Well, oh. we um, unfortunately we are just about out of time. Um, I do want to give, um, chef, I want to give you a chance, you know, you, you're involved obviously with the collaborative, the amazing you work, work you do through the marketplace restaurant. Um, and I'm wondering if there's anywhere else that you would direct people to who want to learn more about, um, sustainable seafood and, and get involved. What are resources and organizations that you like and you like to support, um, when thinking about seafood? Sure. Um, you know, really there's a few of them. And directly with the sockeye, there's the uh, Bristol Bay Regional Seafood Development Association. Um, they are work. kind of the go-to go-to spot for um, for all things sockeye. Um, I would also recommend, uh, like I mentioned, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch Program. They've got a really awesome. handy uh, pocket pocket guide as well as an app you can get for your phone that gives up-to-date listings where they're working in conjunction, in conjunction with, uh, with NOAA, the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, on getting information from federal fisheries about what's, you know, what's being deemed sustainable. Um, you know, I, I also work, from a chef perspective, I also work with um, the Chef Action Network, which is uh, kind of a subsidiary of uh, James Beard Foundation, and mm-hmm. they do a really good job kind of helping, helping lead chefs to find out more information about um, about different programs like Life Chefs Collaborative, like Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch Program, um, to help cool. get to put them in the right direction and to learn more about policy and advocacy of uh, sustainable foods and food systems. That's awesome, Chris. Anyone you would add to that list? Yeah, I was just going to um, um, Environmental Defense Fund. The EDF is also a good um, resource. And then um, there's one more that just slipped out of my mind, but EDF is a great another great uh, resource. And I think, I guess I also try to kind of um, keep um, abreast of some of the publications of the NRDC, the National Resources Defense Council. It's kind of subsidiary to the larger work, but it's really worth uh, worthwhile reading to kind of looking at overall sustainability issues and oftentimes as they relate to fish. But EDF, NRDC. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, guys. Um, definitely wonderful to get to um, explore the season here as we come to just to the very tail end of July. Um, I definitely want to point people in the direction, um, as I said earlier, of the New York Times coverage. Um, The article is Sea Slaves, the Human Misery that Feeds Pets and Livestock uh, by Ian Urbina. Um, It's part of a multi-part series that is really just uh, a a must-read if if you're interested in human rights issues and traceability in our food supply Um, amazing reporting by the times. Um, 
If you want to learn more about Chef Disson, definitely check out the Marketplace Restaurant. You can find them at www.marketplace-restaurant.com. And to learn more about Christopher and, and get on that list for some fish next year, um, find them at redsalmon.com. Thank you guys both for joining us. It was such a good show. Yeah, thanks oh, thank for having you. us. Thank you. I want to I'll give a big shout out to um, Alicia Fowler from the Chefs Collaborative for putting together this show with me. I'm really a big fan of their work. You can find them at Chefs Collaborative. Dot org. Shout out to Jack Inslee, my engineer extraordinaire in the booth today. <laughs> Today's break music was provided by The Landing, and my theme song, as always, is Obey City. Um, obesity, Obey City is how you spell it, though. O B E Y C I T Y. Say it obesity so you sound cool, but when you have to look it up on the internet, uh, it, it is Obey City. Uh, also big shout out, of course, to Tabard Inn down in DC, amazing, um, long-term supporter of the network. Check them out, uh, for any of your DC travel needs. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, if you like what you hear, please find us on iTunes, subscribe, leave a review. Would love to hear from you. Um, and, and stay tuned up next. We have a short clip, uh, from one of my favorite shows on the network. What doesn't kill you hosted by Katie Kiefer. Uh, Katie covers a lot of issues that we touch on here in the Farm Report in much more depth. So if you want to get your policy chops polished to um, a nice shiny tea, definitely check her out. In, in this clip, you're going to hear a little bit from her recent guest, Hod Lipson, and he's going to talk about 3D printing and how to build the breakfast of your dreams. So stay tuned for that. Thank you so much for listening. Stay tuned in. So theoretically, Dr. Lipson, we could be engineering our own like diet plan, say you needed to lose five pounds. Absolutely. Calibrate and that into your machine and then say, okay, feed me that stuff. Professor Hod Lipson explains how 3D printing will change the way you eat on episode 150 of What Doesn't Kill You, hosted by Katie Kiefer. Uh, yeah, you can say factor, my, you know, this is what I want to do, factor that in into, into my, my, my breakfast and it will be factored in, in in whatever way, again, that is not just a, a, a static program, but it will be based on your biometrics. Uh, so, so, so it will be customized and individualized. And uh, you could also uh, imagine that these things adapt over time. So, so people can share these recipes. Can, can, uh, it's not just a fixed recipe that's in a book and, and uh, it's one size fits all. Want to dig deep into the future of 3D printing? Listen to episode 150 of What Doesn't Kill You, hosted by Katie Kiefer, and find archived episodes on heritageradionetwork.org and iTunes. This piece was brought to you by the International Culinary Center, culinarycenter.com. Thanks for listening to this program on heritageradionetwork.org. You can find all of our archived programs on our website or as podcasts in the iTunes store by searching Heritage Radio Network. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at heritage underscore radio. You can email us with questions anytime at info at heritageradionetwork.org. Heritage Radio Network is a 501c3 nonprofit. To donate and become a member, visit our website today. Thanks for listening. I want to tell you about a new podcast called Amuse News. Publishing multiple days a week, Amuse News is your source for food news, interviews from around the food world, and more. On the show, we'll be engaging with food storytellers, from chefs to advocates to people working in the field, and many more. Find Amuse News wherever you get your podcasts. Amuse News is a destination for everyone who's looking for a new, insightful look into the world of food.